Hey everyone, welcome to the webinar series from the Nonfiction Authors Association. I'm your host, Stephanie Chandler. Always appreciate you spending your time with us. I'm excited to bring you this special event, a topic I'm personally very interested in as well. So today our guest speakers are Dave and Melissa from our sponsor, Journey 66. And I'll introduce them in a moment. They're covering how to write a commercially viable memoir. I don't know why that gets tongue twisted for me. Uh, so quick notes before we get started, we are recording this event. Recordings will be sent to all registered attendees later today, along with a copy of the slides. We are going to leave time at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Let's save the chat for kind of chatting amongst ourselves, but the Q&A will be what we'll do at the end of the presentation. And I will pop back in after the lecture to help facilitate Q&A with Dave and Melissa. And this event will last 60 minutes. All right, now I'm thrilled to introduce our guest speakers today. Dave Goetz and Melissa Parks are the founders of Journey 66, an editorial services company and publisher for nonfiction and memoir writers. Dave is a former magazine and book editor and author of three books, including Death by Suburb, How to Keep the Suburbs from Killing Your Soul. That might be the best title I've ever heard, Dave. I love it. <laughs> Dave has coached hundreds of writers and served as editor for books in the area of philanthropy, leadership, spirituality and religion, legacy memoirs, and business. Melissa has 25 years of magazine and digital publishing experience. She has ghostwritten hundreds of articles and books and coach numerous authors on their book writing journeys. Having developed a large Instagram following around her passion for vintage living, Melissa is an Instagram expert. She's also a contributor to numerous national shelter magazines. Dave and Melissa, I am so thrilled to have you here. I'm gonna hand the floor over to you and disappear. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Stephanie, we're so grateful to be here. And uh, just, this is fun. And so we hope that this, uh, this uh, workshop today and webinar really helps you, you supercharge wherever you're at. It was so fun to hear about uh, where several of you are. I thought the one that was the most wonderful was that someone had 110,000 words and they wanted to, to trim. So that's a good place to be, even though it might seem uh, overwhelming. So I'm Dave Getz. And I'm Melissa Park. And I want to talk today, and we want to talk today about how to write a commercially viable memoir. So my wife has a friend. She went to high school with this person, and he eventually became a U.S. congressman. In fact, when they were a senior in high school, he was the president of the high school class and one of the large suburban high schools here in the Chicagoland area where both of us live. And everybody said, well, he's going to be uh, president someday because he was so competent and so authoritative. He's just a great guy, too. He eventually became a U.S. congressman for about 14 years. So at an event, I think it was a dinner one night. It was right before he got elected uh, to be a U.S. congressman. We were talking about his current work. He was an attorney. And we might call the work he did as kind of like an ambulance chaser, but he did these big liability cases. He would take on these cases where people had been wronged, either like, for example, in an accident or something, and would take on their cases and then help them as they um, and pursue those cases, obviously, to some sort of end. So he was an attorney and had this practice with another uh, partner. So we were talking about his cases and he and he said i said oh man you must have no shortage of cases there's so much that's going on he goes you know in actuality dave it's really hard to meet the meet the requirements for a case with us he said and this is what he said he said most people have a bummer they don't have a lawsuit most people have a bummer they don't have a lawsuit there wasn't really any kind of malfeasance or malpractice or something that happened. And he was not trying to be harsh because he was very compassionate about the people he served. But it made me think of, of a memoir as well as we, we start on this journey this afternoon to write a commercially viable memoir. Some of us have a bummer. 
we have a story maybe of suffering, but we may not have a memoir, right? A bummer is not a memoir. So suffering alone, whether it's domestic violence, abuse, death of a loved one, mental illness, that alone is not enough for a memoir. And so the rest of this conversation this morning is this afternoon is going to be about that, right? So it's going to be how to write a commercially viable memoir. So I want to be very careful that we don't, uh, when I say bummer, I, I'm not making light of any suffering that has gone on. But it's really important to know that having something happen to you is not necessarily a memoir. So any experience by itself is not a memoir. So today we want to walk through five points to help you begin writing a commercially viable memoir. And the first point is to define what a commercially viable memoir is not. And so it is not a family legacy book. And I know some of you are joining us and saying you want, you're writing a family legacy book or you're working on one, you wanna write one. And that is a great way to spend your time. However, a commercially viable memoir is not a family legacy book. A family legacy book has a very narrow audience. They're your friends, they're your family, and the threshold for great writing is much less. They will endure bad writing because they love you and they care about your story. So a family legacy memoir has a very narrow audience. A commercially viable memoir has a much larger audience. If you want to sell it, you're by nature going to have a larger audience. Commercially viable memoir is also not an autobiography. And I'm sure you guys have heard this already, but we're going to repeat it again. An autobiography is a writing that covers the entire span of your life from birth until either death, it can't be death because that's, you're still alive, you're still alive. <laughs> where you are now. And so it covers almost every major event in your life and sometimes really minor um, insignificant events that most people don't care about. And unless you're Taylor Swift or Michelle Obama or President Obama, people really don't care where you were born, who your first grade teacher was, and who your first kiss was when you were 14 years old. They just don't care, right? So a commercially viable memoir is not an autobiography. It is also not a random collection of stories or confessional type of journal writing. And a lot of us go into memoir writing because we want to heal and it becomes this way therapeutic for us, right? We say we, we want to write a memoir and, because it will help us heal and somebody else will learn from our experience. And so we just start writing confessionally and we don't really think about the larger structure and it becomes almost self-indulgent. And it may be beneficial for you to start there to get some of your ideas out and to start the healing. But a commercially viable memoir is not just a random collection of stories or confessional writings that feels a little bit more like a journal entry. So recently we worked on a memoir. It was a family legacy memoir. And it's a good example of what a family legacy memoir is. It was an Orthodox Jewish businessman who uh, immigrated from South Africa to the U.S., and in so doing, he sold a business to uh, a big German company, and his ancestors had been persecuted by the Germans, of course, in World War II, and yet he had um, sold his business to them about a generation later. But his audience was only 50 copies. We wrote this autobiography, and there were only 50 copies that were produced. It was never posted on Amazon. You can't buy it. It was very expensive because he wanted to tell the story of, uh, and actually the name of the book was called Zaidi, which is uh, Yiddish for grandfather. And he wanted to pass on the legacy to his, his children. So it's really important as you think about writing a memoir that you're very, very clear that a commercially viable memoir is not a family memoir for a variety of reasons. And I'll start out our point two is a commercially viable memoir is so good that people are willing to pay for it, much like you would pick up a trade book or even a fiction. They are willing to fork over 1995 or 
$9.95 if it's an if it's an ebook, because they've heard through reviews or through somebody else that has read it that it is so good you've got to purchase this book. So when you are writing a memoir, you got to think of it as a popular book, something like a John Grisham, even something that's so captivating that's a page turner, people can't put it down. So one of the big challenges today, we live in a world in which content is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And free content is everywhere. I was just talking to someone about they were, in fact, we were talking with uh, Stephanie, actually, she was how, learning how to paint. She watched those videos on YouTube. Most likely that was free, free content. There's so much content. So a commercially viable memoir is is different in kind because you're asking someone to pay $9.95 for it or $19.95 or $25.95. That is a different animal when you think about it, that the content is so good that they'd be willing to pay for it. So as we think about a commercially viable memoir is that what makes it commercially viable is that someone is willing to pay for it. And by the way, when you pitch a commercially viable memoir to an agent, that is what he or she is thinking. They're thinking about an audience. First of all, they're thinking, Do am I interested in this as an agent? And if I'm interested in it, is, would, is there an audience for this that would pay for it? And then ultimately, if you're going to publish traditionally, is there a traditional publish, publisher that would acquire it and actually pay the author money to publish the book? All right, point three, we're moving through these pretty quickly. We're gonna slow down a little bit now, but a commercially viable me memoir must have a meta idea. And a meta idea is simply an overarching theme, something in which all of the stories, major and minor, hang off of. And everything that does not fit within that theme you kick out. So this person that has over 100,000 words, you might begin by thinking, what is my meta idea? What is my theme? And are there stories that simply don't support this theme that I can get rid of? Because your job as the author of this memoir is to curate events that contribute to a single goal. And that single goal is to help people understand a theme, meaning, uh, meaning of events better. So as we talk about this meta idea, I think we should drill down to, into it a little bit. So what is a meta idea? So a meta idea is not a topic, right? But it's what you're saying about a topic. So for example, your story might be about surviving abuse or a tragic accident or some other life altering event. So your meta idea is what you're going to say about those events, the meaning of those events, not simply that you survive. So it's just not a recounting of that story. That is not a memoir. And so one of the challenges is when you start to write a memoir, it's hard to stitch together all these different things that you want to stitch together in the form of a memoir if you don't have this overarching theme a big idea, a meta narrative, whatever you want to call it, but it's some idea from which every story in that book that you choose to put in that book hangs off of that idea. I'm going to give a quick example. Okay, good. I'm working with a friend right now who's at the very early stages of thinking about writing a memoir because she has had a lot of bummers in her life. So she um, suffered sexual abuse as a child. She was raped older. She then um, got into a marriage with an alcoholic abusive husband. Her son died as a teenager. And so there are a lot of bummers in her life and a lot of heartache and a lot of her trying to rise above that heartache. Like she left her husband once and then went back and then she left again. And then, then something else happened. She had a felony on her record. And so as we were talking about all of these events and we're really grappling with, okay, what is the big idea? And we started to talk about how, how she has hidden things her entire life and her journey to living in truth, in light. And so we started to grapple with this idea, what does it mean to live in untruthfulness, deceit, and what it means to 
to live in truthfulness and her journey throughout all these key moments in her life when either she hid things and it made things worse or it helped her survive possibly in that moment, but how ultimately it led to maybe more heartache until she finally realizes what it's like to live in light. So that's a narrative arc, that's transformation, and that is um, the meta idea. And you said it one way. How did you say it? It's it, it, it's what creates meaning throughout all these stories, right? There's something more than just the story itself. There's this, so for her, it's from darkness to light, from dishonesty to honesty, from hiding the truth to being comfortable with the truth, and not just with yourself, but with others. So talk just a little bit, and this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but talk a little bit about how she might structure it in terms of, we'll talk about more structure later, but she might not start at the beginning. Right. She may start. She doesn't have to start in seventh grade, right? <laughs> I mean, arguably she could start in a moment where she was trying to live in truth and honesty when she left her husband the first time, or maybe the second time when she felt the freest, but then she slipped back in to, to darkness. And th that would be fairly gripping because it's like, how could you go from living in this hopeful place to you know, going back and retreating into some of these these more destructive patterns. So we're going to talk a little bit more about structure in, in the next slide. But in this slide, we want to talk about something very, very practical right now. And even if you're in the middle of your memoir and you feel stuck, sometimes going, sometimes going back to some of these basic activities can help you get unstuck. So let's talk about this beginning process of identifying stories and minor stories and what are they? Okay, yeah. So this is really, this first step is really to help you identify your meta idea. If you are thinking, I wanna write a story and the topic is around um, this illness that I overcame. All right, so uh, that's probably the major story. Maybe the major story is when you started to feel sick for this first time. Another major story, maybe when you got the diagnosis. Another major story, maybe when um, you had a, a, a surgery. And maybe another major story is when, um, <clears throat> when you finally had a, a surgery that that healed you but you start to identify these major stories and you'll probably have about in this brainstorming phase 10 to 15 and these these rise to the top right they are easy they you don't have to struggle to find what those major stories are then you want to identify your minor stories and your minor stories they have a beginning and an end but they're not they don't have hugely high stakes, but you want to write them down. Write down every minor or major story that comes to mind, and you're going to have a pretty big list. Maybe you'll have 50, maybe you'll have 70. And what you'll end up doing is you'll end up um, grouping them by theme. So maybe the one theme is fear, and you have this, this, um, this group of stories that relate to fear. Maybe you have another group related to friendship. Maybe you have another group... Um, related to, um, to, to practice practices that, that helped you overcome certain things. I don't know what they're going to be, but you start to see the themes. And then from all those, those minor themes, you start to see what your overarching theme is. And that's your meta idea. And when you do this exercise, an idea might pop up that you didn't even know existed prior. You're like, oh, I thought I was writing about this but really this is the idea that is going to be driving every single story that I put into this memoir. And that's sometimes one of the hard things, right? Is that you, you start writing and you get down the road and you realize the initial idea that you had is not actually the real idea. So then you have to regroup. So I just want to pause here to say that it's really important in this moment, if you're just starting out, especially on writing a memoir to do this. So um, don't spend a lot of time writing out what the major story is. Just list it, right? And maybe one sentence. And if you want to do it on a whiteboard or you want to do it on a, a yellow pad with little uh, post-it notes, the more visual, the better. And, um, and so if you start to do this, you'll find that suddenly you've made a thousand miles of progress in your thinking about your book. We're going to talk a little bit later about slowing down to do this kind of work. Um, but I, we want to continue now about talking about um, um, structure. And so if you're going to think about writing a commercially viable memoir, you need to write it like a novel. And there's so much to talk about uh, in this area. And 
most of you are coming from nonfiction because you're part of the nonfiction writers association. So the challenge when you come from a nonfiction background is that you want to write informationally. You want to give information. And, and so we struggle, those of us who come from nonfiction, and I come from a nonfiction background, uh, Death by Suburb, that I wrote was actually memoir as a writing style. It was more of a narrative nonfiction, but it was one part memoir. It was about my story. So I was kind of the protagonist in a sense. We'll talk about that uh, in that. But, but your, your book needs to really be written like a novel. And so your structure and how you structure it, we've already talked about some of these major and minor see, uh, scenes. We're going to get more specific about that. But your structure matters. So there's a phrase called a story arc or a narrative arc. You've probably heard about that. But when you read a novel, the book starts somewhere in this place, usually you know, it might be in a bad place. For example, think about the book Into Thin Air, which is a memoir of John Krakauer in 1996 when he summited uh, Mount Everest. And I think six people died on that trip. I don't think all, I think may have been, I don't know if all were part of his, his group, but during that ascent, six people di died of the elements. They either fell in a crevice or they froze up there. So he wrote the book Into Thin Air. And if you look, the beginning of his book doesn't start at the beginning where he started to think about going on this trip. It starts as he's summiting Mount Everest. And, and that's where the story begins. The story arc begins as he's summiting Mount Everest. And then he does flashbacks, of course. And at the end is, is what happens after they discover the deaths and kind of the aftermath of what happened there. So your your structure does matter, but you need to think of it as an arc. There's a story arc, or another word is narrative arc. You begin here, and then you end in a much different place. And one way to begin thinking about your narrative arc or to begin to create the structure is to think in terms of scenes. And really, if you're writing a memoir, it's probably 50, 60,000, maybe 70,000 words. And in that scope of a memoir, you need about 40 to 60 scenes. And a scene is simply a mini story with a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Something happens, right? There's some sort of action, some sort of something is at stake, right? And so you have these 45 or 60 scenes that you're going to pace throughout your entire story. And in, in order to find the pacing of that, you need to identify what your tent pole scenes are. And we recommend having about six to seven tent pole scenes. What's a tent pole? <laughs> so a tent pole, you think of it, is it, they, it creates structure for a tent, right? It holds up the tent. And so um, tent poles are going to hold up your memoir. It's what's going to give your memoir structure. So there's going to be a tent pole scene at the beginning, something yep. significant. There'll probably be a few in the middle and then one at the conclusion where there's the climax and then some sort of denouement resolution story. So those are probably your tent pole scenes. And then in between those, those tent pole scenes, those six to seven tent pole scenes, you're going to sprinkle in about four to five, maybe six minor scenes. And if you've done your homework, you're going to know what some of those are. Some of them will come as you're writing it, but you'll know and you'll relate those to the tent pole scenes. Like you say you have this opening scene, but you need this minor scene that wrote that's a flashback to childhood to help the reader understand why you acted this way in this tent pole scene to give context. Or maybe you need a little scene to help develop your character. So you see your so you help the reader see your own frailty. Um, there, so you you put these minor scenes between these tent pole scenes to create some pacing, but you want those tent pole scenes because that really raises the interest of the reader at significant moments and it keeps them going throughout. One of the key things, so, is to ask yourself, if you don't have five to seven tent pole scenes, you may not have a memoir. Or if you don't have 45 to 60 or 70 possible scenes, you may not have a memoir. You may have more of a short story or a short memoir. Maybe it's only a 10,000 word kind of an essay 
um, slash memoir, but it's not a full memoir. So if you're stuck in this moment, if you're stuck, sometimes it's because you don't have enough scenes. And so you're struggling to create something out of nothing. And so in this moment, it's good to go back to that previous slide where you start now to write out major stories and minor stories. And so the tent pole, the tent pole scenes are are key. I I think about this book that I just mentioned, Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. It was his memoir of summiting Mount Everest. Um, he went on this trip as a journalist, and it turned out that all these people died on it. In fact, the reason he, I think he was originally um, doing this as an article for Outside Magazine. So he was a journalist coming along as a, as a mountain climber, and, and it turned out to be this hugely tragic event. So there are definitely four to five or maybe five to seven tentpole scenes, but certainly that first one is a tentpole scene. Sometimes all we have is that first one, and we have to step back and say, Maybe we don't have enough. If we don't have five to seven tent pole, these anchor scenes, it may be very difficult to make progress in your memoir. And in that moment, we just encourage you to pause, slow down and go back and say, okay, let's reevaluate about how many major and minor stories that we have. All right. We started off this point about you, your memoir needs to be written like a novel. And we have an acronym called ACTS to help you create these scenes, much like you'd create a scene in a piece of fiction. And Dave, I'll let you take the A if you'd like. OK, so again, it's ACTS. It's a simple acronym. We're simple people, so it helps us keep things straight. So every scene or mini story. So scene is a mini story every scene or mini story that you have in your book has to have these four things right and the first one is action something has to happen in that scene the biggest mistake in first time memoirists is that nothing happens often for example just recently um, someone asked us to look at a memoir the first draft of a memoir that this person was writing on behalf of this um, entrepreneur, very successful person. And the opening chapter is the scene where as a young man, this person gets arrested. So great idea for an opening chapter. It's a great idea. So this person was on the right path, but the whole chapter was one scene. So it is a tent pole scene, but nothing happens during that. So, for example, after the first couple paragraphs, he makes good description. He talks about the um, flashing red lights and being uh, handcuffed. and But nothing happens from then on. All it is is his thinking about how hot the car is, what his parents are going to think. It's all thinking. And one of the great signals that your memoir is struggling is that it's all thinking. It's all stuff in your head, right? And so that's why this acronym ACTS is so helpful. There has to be action in every one of your scenes. Something has to happen. There has to be movement, certainly in your tentpole scenes, right? Your tentpole scenes, something has to be at stake, something so dramatically that so dramatic that I want to turn the page and find out if it's only thinking, I'm thinking about this, about how I felt and I felt scared and I felt this, it's just not compelling to move. So every scene, every mini story that you have in your book, the first is that it has to have action. The C stands for characters. And if you've read many novels, you know that the best stories are those in which characters are complex, right? Their motivations are complex. <laughs> they're not entirely good and they're not entirely bad. And so you, as the protagonist of your story, also need to be complex. You cannot paint yourself as an entirely heroic character, nor can you paint yourself 
myself as a villain that would or a, a victim excuse me because that would get exhausting for the reader there'd be no sympathy oh she's just be playing the victim again right so you've got to strike that balance of both showing your weaknesses and your strengths and then also who are those people in your life that shape you as the protagonist who is the antagonist and how can you um as not an omniscient narrator, but as a person who has experience with these, these people, try to understand their motivations and their behavior. And if you, that's part of the joy of writing is you can't get inside um, those characters' heads, but you can try to understand it, right? And that's going to add a rich layer to your writing if you can also try to understand your characters, um, aside from you, the protagonist, the other characters, and what's motivating them. And it will create some sympathy, it will help um, your reader try to understand people better as well. And when you're, um, hu when you're humble as well as um, vulnerable at the same time that's what your reader is going to latch on to they they want to read because they they are invested in you as a character i just want to build on that because you said something that was so true about either being heroic or just being the victim so for example if you're telling a scene in which um let's say you have your ex-husband is being abusive to you you have the act of abuse but if you paint him out only to be bad throughout this whole memoir, then we see him as one dimensional. We only see him as this bad person and you as the person who accepts it. So, and while that might be true, how do you write that in a way that shows complexity? It shows how dark this person is, let's say, but maybe there's, a, he comes home a little later and he's warm and he's, because this is how these things are, right? They're not all bad. They're not all good. It's a mix of the two. So a well-written memoir is complex, meaning the characters are not all just, they're not all good and they're not all evil, but yet there's this persistence and this character trait that starts to develop over time. I was just thinking about your friend that you're working on that memoir with. Her journey is from being really dishonest with herself and not talking about it to moving to becoming honest with herself and it's a wonderful it's a long journey it's a painful journey but it's a wonderful journey and she's very self-reflective as she writes this and that is what you want to be is kind of kind of almost like you you uh you're kind of self-deprecating you see yourself for what's happening in the moment but yet you're moving the story along absolutely all right so t what does t stand okay for? so t stands for talking and so talking is another word for dialogue. So in novel writing, in story writing, if you want to write a story, you have to have dialogue. Something needs to happen. And there's usually it, it's between characters. They're talking to each other. For example, I told you the story of this memoir, um, this first chapter of this scene in which this person is arrested. There was no there there's no dialogue in there. One suggestion for him as he was working on this would be for him to maybe overhear chatter between the police officers. Maybe they were talking about going to the donut shop, right? So you could juxtapose this really traumatic moment that he's experienced with this kind of shallow conference conversation between um, two officers. Well, that would be, that's a form of dialogue. Or perhaps he got into it with the arresting officer. There might be some, some dialogue that goes on between them. By the way, and this is, should be really noted in this moment, when you're writing memoir, you can't remember everything as it actually happened, right? So you're constructing scenes and you're imagining things. So it's not exactly the way it happens. And the reader knows this. In memoir, there's kind of this tacit, um, agreement between the reader and the writer that they know that the way they're writing about it didn't happen exactly, right? You're, you're creating scenes and drama through the use of these techniques to move the reader along and tell the story. I'll also add to that that talking or dialogue creates immediacy. So the reader actually feels like they're in that moment with you. And it's also a way to show versus tell. And if you've done any sort of fiction writing, then you know that cliche, show, don't tell. And dialogue with dialogue tags is an excellent way to show 
versus tell, because there's nothing worse than reading <laughs> a story that's all about telling. You lose the reader when you do that. So dialogue is a really good way to do that, really smart thing to do. And the final S is setting. Setting. So talk about setting. <laughs> so the setting is simply where the scene takes place. And again, it's about creating immediacy and drawing the reader into the space in which this this conflict is happening or this event is happening. And so setting includes all the senses, right? What you see, what you taste, what you smell, what you feel, where people are positioned in relationship to you, um, uh, with sounds that are present. And all of this is a way to create immediacy, to bring people into the moment. And that's what you want when you're writing um, a memoir, any type of story, anything that is going to be read and then referred as people buying into that moment, seeing themselves in that moment, feeling that moment, so that you can get to that deeper meaning. Because if you have them there, then you can start to, to impart your wisdom and the meaning that you want people to take away with them. A good example of seeing, or not seeing, a good example of setting <laughs> might be, uh, I'm a fly fisher and I fly fish, I fly fish my entire life. But I've spent many, many years uh, going back to Yellowstone National Park. In fact, the north entrance in that north park, I know quite well. There's sections I know quite well. But one time, I was we were hiking back, and we ran into a herd of bison that were in the middle of the trail. And I made some comment. This is a good use of dialogue, if I were going to use this. <laughs> I said to my friend, I actually said to him, I said, you know what? Those bison, they're like milk cows they'll get up. Let's just keep walking towards them. So at that point, we were only about 75 yards away from them. We saw them up in the head, but there's no place for us to go. We can go back, but we can't go to the right because that's where the Yellowstone River, you can't cross it, you'll drown. It's, it's coming too fast. There was a ridge to the right, to the left, so we couldn't go up. So we kept walking. So we kept walking. So this would be a great time to describe the scene. I just told you the river is running too fast. We could talk about some colors. It was the fall. Maybe the aspen were turning. Maybe some of the willows were turning red. So that is what you talk about when you talk about scene. You setting. Setting. Excuse me. Not <laughs> scene. Setting. You help people imagine where you're at when it happens. All right. So our final point, and this is a really important point and something that if you're in the middle of writing your memoir already, you may want to like pause and do this step. And that is to identify comps. And that's just simply comparable memoirs to yours, the one that you think you're writing or, or you are writing. And a comparable is simply the category in which your memoir exists. There are so many categories for memoirs. I mean, there are animal memoirs, dog memoirs, dog memoir, specifically yeah. there our journey memoirs, people taking hikes along the Pacific Coast um, Trail. There are 9-11 memoirs, right? Lots of people after 9-11 wrote memoirs based on their experience of that day. There are cancer memoirs. There are divorce memoirs. You get the idea. There are all these different categories of memoirs, and you've got to figure out where yours exists. And the reason is... Because when you're pitching an agent, that's exactly what he or she will do. They go, oh, this is a divorce memoir, or this is an addiction memoir, or this is a travel memoir. And once they do that, they immediately will think about the other ones that they have published like that one. And so you just need to make sure you know that when you're writing it, one, it'll give clarity to your writing, but it'll also help you be very, very specific if and when you decide to pitch this to an agent it, you know, you start out, this is a this is a travel memoir, and it has to do when I did the Appalachian Trail from 19, you know, 95 to 19, you know, 96 during the summer months, whatever it was, whatever the, but it's a travel memoir or an adventure memoir. So why is it so important, though, to, to do some research in that category? Well, in addition to your pitch to your literary agent or publisher, it also helps you make your memoir unique, right? And that's what literary agents are looking for. They're looking for, does an audience exist for this type of memoir? And also, how is yours going to stand out from the rest? What are you going to offer that hasn't already been offered to the mass market? if you want it to be commercially viable. We keep on going back to that point. And so you study these books and say you're going to write 
a dog, <laughs> a dog book, a dog memoir, like Marley and Me or Your Favorite Culture, Culture by yeah. Macbeth. Those usually start out with the puppy coming into your life and then the death of the dog, right? That's usually the structure. So you're like, oh, well, I could do that structure or to make mine unique, I could do a different structure. Maybe it doesn't end with the death of the dog. Or maybe it starts with the death of the dog and then it goes forward or maybe... Um, the dog never dies at all, and it follows um, the person's journey more than it follows the dog's journey. The, the idea is that you want to look at these comparables so that you can see how you can make yours different. And this goes along with tone. Maybe some memoirs are more comedic in tone, and you want yours to be more serious, and it goes along with voice. How are you going to make your voice different than the voice of that of memoir that's already out there that sounds a lot like yours? We all want to write something that's unique, right? We all, and we believe that it's unique. And certainly our stories are unique. I don't know why this is. There is kind of a resistance that we have. I have this about doing these comps. And I don't, I'm trying to figure out what the <laughs> resistance is. I think it's because we feel like our idea is so unique. It's never been done before. And there's part of that that's true. It hasn't been done before because you haven't written it. But it has been done before. And so you do need to know what's out there because that will enable your story and your voice, your style, your structure, as you're talking about, um, to be unique. And, you know, what does your book want to be or need to be uniquely? And, and I tell you what, having that uh, information in front of you is so helpful. And I, I'll just say one other thing as we're thinking about that, that first chapter this is kind of a, a sidebar. That first chapter um, is so critical when you send this to an agent, because if that is not a page turner, from, if that chapter doesn't make that agent want to turn to page, you know, turn to chapter two, you don't have a shot at landing an agent. So it's so important to know the comps, know your style, and know how you're different. And I'm confident that you two can really create a unique memoir. All right. So you've made it with us this far. Thank you so much for being with us. We want to end on an encouraging note and also just with some words of wisdom, having worked with many memoirists over the years, and that is writing a memoir is going to take you longer than you expect. <laughs> and it's hard work because you're dipping into spaces of your life that might be potentially emotionally challenging. You're probably having to deal with um, some parts of maybe your, your upbringing or your family that are, are challenging. Maybe you are even what, having to delay it because you don't want to hurt somebody who still is alive. But writing a memoir is just going to take you longer than you expect. Writing books is just a long journey, and it's not something that you typically can do in a few months. So expect the, the work to be long and hard. We often mock, you know, you've probably seen on, um, you know, different places where you can write a book in 30 days. And that's just the silliest thing ever. You can write a really bad book in 30 days. I, you definitely cannot write a commercially viable memoir in 30 days. I just don't see it. If you've never thought about it before and you start on day one. And so this idea of speed and uh, being able to do it quickly, I think you, it's, a, it's a notion that should not enter your mind because I think you want to write the best possible memoir you can. I, I heard about this uh, metaphor for writing uh, years ago. I kind of remember where I heard it. So it, it's not original with me, but um, and, and it's this writing a book is not a marathon. It's just not right. If you look at people who are great at writing at, at running marathons, they're gaunt, right? They're thin. And after they cross the finish line, they collapse. And so this author uh, who had written many books said he thought that the better metaphor for writing is that writing a memoir or any book is like a series of short sprints. So think of the body of a sprinter. Think of all those athletes. They're muscular. They run really fast and then they rest. They run really fast for a short distance. So maybe as you think about this and writing this book for uh, this memoir, think of it as a series of short sprints. Maybe you run a mile and then you think about taking a rest or you run a hundred yards and you rest. And the idea is not stopping the work, but taking time and just, it's more of a mental um, discipline to realize it's going to take longer than you think. And stopping and starting is a normal part of the writing journey. And this probably is something 
something that you would expect <laughs> a webinar on no more writing to cover, and that is to pursue vulnerability without becoming overly sentimental or um, maudlin, right? You, you want to be vulnerable because that's how people identify with you. You want readers to so identify with you that they want to know what happens to you. They want to complete that narrative arc. They want to see how you are transformed and they want to be part of that transformation. And I think even you want to challenge them to, to take their own journey. And so if you're vulnerable and share the struggle of that, the ups and the downs, people are going to hang with you for the duration of your memoir. I just want to add on that point that vulnerability is the big differentiator between a family legacy memoir and a commercially viable memoir. Um, it's just simply family legacy memoirs typically do not have that vulnerability and, and thus they're unreadable, right? In that sense, they're, they're, um, uh, they're readable for the family, but the family's not going to hear about, you know, they're not going to talk about the doubt you had maybe after your second child or, you know, what, whatever the story arc is. So, but, uh, so vulnerability is really important. Uh, and I love that phrase without becoming too sentimental or too modeling. I would say another point here is we, and this is, <laughs> we're juxtaposing two things. Don't just write, but write, meaning as you saw in some of these points today, we are talking about slowing down to write down all the scenes. Uh, if you get stuck, maybe you're stuck because you don't have another tent pole scene and you need a tent pole scene. So slow down. Stop writing to slow down and think about structure. Often, if you're stuck, as I said earlier, it's because you're broken down on the structure and you just need to slow down long enough, rethink it, and you'll be back on the road quickly. The other thing is slow down and with the comps too, slow down to, to, to look at some of these other memoirs. But the other part is that is right. So you have to continue to write, right? So it's both slow down when you need to slow down, but continue to write, continue to make progress because it's only as you write that you start to see the problems that need to be fixed, right? And so that's just the nature of, of writing. And the perfect way to end that is to say, as we say here at Journey 66, now it's time to buckle up and write. Thank you so much for being with us and we'll gladly take your questions now. Great job guys, thank you so much. I'm putting a link to your handout yeah, thank in you. the chat as well. Um, so make sure everybody, can you tell us quickly what that handout is about? Yeah, the handout is simply to help you begin to make progress on structuring your memoir. So it talks a little bit about the major and minor stories, but it also gives you some other strategies for figuring out what your structure is for your memoir. If, you, if you're if you at the very beginning stages, I know some of you are well into your memoir writing. So that's the case and this may not be helpful unless you're trying to figure out where you went wrong. <laughs> I thought that was really great. Uh, okay, so questions. If you have a question, pop them in the Q and A. Mike asks, I recently heard it suggested that I have lots or at least several memoirs in me, each one based around some theme that emerges from my life story. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's true. And usually when you're you're writing a memoir and it creeps on and on and on and gets um, to be so big, it's because you're trying to cover too many themes. And that which is most specific is most interesting, right? So if you can be specific about one theme, it's going to be so much more engaging if you try to uh, touch generally on multiple themes. So absolutely, you can definitely have more than one life theme that could merit um, a memoir. It would just be about going back and seeing if you have those tentpole scenes and enough scenes to really engage the reader from the beginning to end. So if I were you looking to start a memoir, I would first answer, what am I most passionate about? What do I have the most energy around? Which topic, which theme? And I would start there. And also, which topic or theme do I have the most major and minor stories? Because that will be easier to write. Um, so what do you have the most passionate around? What do you have the most scenes, stories to support it? Would you add anything? No, to that? that's great. That's <laughs> it. We had several questions about um, genre and memoir versus fiction and prescriptive memoirs. So I'm going to start with Stuart's here. I've written three books based on my life, but I wrote them as fiction, An Imperfect Oath, Hunter Hunted, 
and The Guardian. Could they be considered memoir since they are based on truths in my life? Mm -hmm. So the answer is probably no. I, I mean, I think in your head or for your family, I think that would be fine. They, the, our topic today is a commercially viable memoir. And so, um, so I would say no to that. And I would say a gentle no, because one of the challenges that we all face when we're starting to write memoirs, in fact, I've been thinking about writing, I've never, I, Death by Suburb that I wrote was really, what it was more narrative nonfiction, but it was one part memoir because I was the protagonist, as I mentioned earlier. I've thought about doing a memoir on the four years I spent uh, in boarding school for high school on the prairies of South Dakota. My parents sent me to a boarding school. And so as I've been thinking about the tent pole scenes and thinking about all that, the one struggle that I have is if I write a memoir about those years, how do I write a compelling memoir without hurting the people that were a part of my life? Because there were only 16 people in my graduating class. And there are now only 15 because one of them has passed away. So um, you think you're writing a novel. So so the question is, yeah. So the question is instead of a memoir, I might say, I really need to write a novel. And I and that might be why uh, the the uh, the question, it might be you put them into three novels because because of that issue. And I totally Totally understand that. But I think the topic is about a commercially viable memoir and, and it, those uh, novels do not fit into that category. All right. Uh, Scott says, should memoirs be self-help themed or more practical based for the audience? Well, we were talking a little bit about this um, before the webinar started. And I think um, as Dave alluded to in his Death by Suburb, that is a more practical book with memoir as a writing style driving the book. So if you're going to go the practical route, I think it's going to be more memoir as a style versus memoir. I think in pure memoirs, it's probably more reflective rather than prescriptive. When you say prescriptive, it's it seems more like here are three things that um, to overcome such and such. And that feels more like a traditional nonfiction book rather than a memoir. Would you add anything to that, David? Yes, it's a really good question. And I think one of the challenges, all of us, that I come from a nonfiction writing background as well. So when you come from a nonfiction writing background, you want to tell people stuff. Like you have ideas that you want them to know about, <laughs> right? And, and memoir is not that, right? Memoir is not telling people what they need to think or things they need to do. That should be a typical nonfiction book. A memoir is the story of your life with this overarching theme that is about your this movement in your life, this transformation that happens. And so this idea of having practical stuff that they should take away, that is kind of a secondary thing. Um, after they read a really compelling memoir, there it might be a cautionary tale, right? But that would be a second. You wouldn't like at in the in the end of some chapter say, now there's three points here. Um, you know, we should be careful not to do this. That kind of prescriptive stuff that automatically eliminates it from being a memoir. At least a commercially viable one. <laughs> at least a commercially viable one, right? And that's our topic today. Our topic isn't all memoirs. Yeah, and that's not to say you can't flip it and make a self-help book with totally. facts of your life, right? Absolutely. Life stories. So that is Absolutely. very different. Uh, Stuart says, can you give a, a clarification of what is a tent pole scene? Yeah, so a tent pole scene, I, maybe you'll have to help me because maybe the way I described it wasn't clear enough. But a tent pole scene, if you think about it in fiction, it's where something is at stake. So if you think of like Star Wars, for instance, and Luke Skywalker finds out that Darth Vader is his father, that is a tentpole scene. What is Luke going to do? Is he going to kill him? Is he going to retreat? What is he going to do with this newfound information? It's a big scene. If you think of the trilogy, those first three movies that came out in the 70s and 80s, that's a pivotal moment. That is a tentpole scene. Um, I, maybe another temple scene in the Star Wars is when, maybe this would be more of a minor scene, is when he tells um, Leia that 
their their siblings. That's that's kind of a, a major scene as well because they had this kind of flirtatious relationship up until a point, and now what are you going to do? How's that going to make the relationship change? So a temple scene is where the stakes are very high, and the main character you could go one of many directions that has consequences that could lead to a negative place or maybe a positive place. Um, I don't know if you could explain it any better than that, Dave. No, but let me give you another example. So let's, that's just such a great question. So I, I think there are two errors in this moment. One is not to have enough tent pole scenes. So if you're struggling often, you don't, you haven't identified those. There are these huge moments. So they're big, they're large, something hinges on it and it moves the story in a completely new direction um, often. That's a tentpole scene. So sometimes you may not have enough of these. And so you're struggling to kind of like, what's the storyline here? Because there's not enough of those. Or you might see all your scenes as tentpole scenes. They're not, they just can't be. Not in a commercially viable memoir. Here's an example. So let's say that I was, I decided, yep, I'm going to write the memoir of the years that I spent on the South Dakota prairies at this boarding school, right? And so what would that be? What's the meta idea of that? So probably that would be a coming of age story. And I think as it stands right now, and I'm not in the middle of it, but as I thought about it, it would probably coming to terms with incredible loneliness of being alone in a place where nobody knows you and you have to build friendships to survive and to and to and to actually thrive and i would say that i ended up thriving but it was really lonely so one of the scenes might be one of the tent pole scenes might be the soft my sophomore year in the fall of my sophomore year um i was in a speech class and I had been a wrestler my freshman year. I wrestled. So you had to do a demonstration speech. And so I did a wrestling demonstration speech. And I asked a friend who was my roommate, because this is a boarding school. He was also a wrestler. He was much bigger than I. I asked him to come forward and I was going to demonstrate the reverse or what's called the switch. If you if you know, it's when the person on the bottom ends up going like this and ends up on the top. It's a move, right? So I asked my friend to come up and he did it really hard. Like he was on the bottom and he did the switch. I wasn't prepared for it. My hand fell out and my face hit the cement floor and broke two of my teeth out. And from that moment on, I got rushed to, um, of course, this is the middle of rural South Dakota, right? And so the closest dentist was like 45 minutes away and the pain and being taken there, not by your parents, but by the principal of the school. And it, the whole thing, that would be a tent pole scene because it would show the, the utter loneliness and being alone and what you have to do to fend for yourself when your parents are 250 miles away. So these tent pole scenes are just big. Right. And they're pivotal and you don't have an endless supply of them. There are probably, as you said, four to seven that are in every book. And your book should start with one of those tentpole scenes. And it probably ends with some with a tentpole scene as well. So you have three others or four others in the middle of your book. All right. We just have a couple of minutes left, so we can't get to all of your questions. And I just want to note. We're not going to address legal questions today, but we do have an upcoming webinar on legal issues and writing. So uh, come back for that or watch your inbox for that. Uh, Rita, I'm going to squeeze in one more. Rita says, my nonfiction book is about our family's journey of love and learning and raising an autistic son. So why would my story be different from anyone else's? My autistic son has over 600 followers on 600,000 followers on TikTok and followers want to hear his story. My question is, will this be enough to have a book that will sell? What else can I do to make this successful? So first of all, having 600,000 followers, an agent won't even care about the story. And I'm not saying it's an important story. I'm just telling you that agents will often, as, as all of you know, what do they care about? And Stephanie, you've done such a great job uh, with your association, helping people with platform, right? So you have a platform. So you already have a built-in audience. So, um, and so your question is what will make it unique? I think that is number one, you're writing the story, right? It's a memoir 
about, so the question is, is it your son's story? Is it your story? And I think if you're writing a memoir, it's your story. And so, um, and so it could be a narrative nonfiction book, right? It could be the story of, of, of your son's wonderful life and all the things he's overcome and accomplished and, and the family, it could be a narrative. So I, I guess in my, in this moment, I don't know that it's a memoir. Maybe it's a narrative nonfiction. It's a very story driven book. That's the story of your son's um, journey. And that's different from a memoir. It's a legitimate category and uh, uh, what's called uh, this. Um, Memoirs of style. No, it's, it, it would be, it'd be a style of writing, right? Very first person, maybe. It doesn't have to be a memoir. It doesn't have to be your story. It can be really his story, which would then put it in the bucket of a narrative nonfiction. Different category from, from a commercially viable memoir. Great questions, you guys. Um, uh, Dave and Melissa, you're getting tons of great comments. Thank you for the webinar. A couple of people said best webinar they've ever attended on writing. Bravo. Fabulous hour. Great use of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, you guys, we will send the recording, a copy of the slides and a link to that download uh, with the record with the recording in an email later today. You'll be able to see the chat. Uh, sorry, we couldn't get to all of your questions. They were excellent, but I tried to get the ones that were most relevant to everyone. So uh, Dave and Melissa, remind everyone where they can connect with you. You can go to www.journey66.com. So it's the word journey and the two numbers, 66. You can go there and uh, you can contact us there or, or download the, uh, the link that uh, Stephanie put in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Great job, you guys. If you could send us the slides in PDF, we will share with everyone else. Thank you so much. I learned a lot as well. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.